Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good afternoon, my name is Dan Rundy. I'm a senior vice president and hold a Schreier chair at CSIS. It's a sincere pleasure for me to be hosting this webinar today and introducing it. Uh, the conversation we're gonna be having is about analyzing the role of the European Union in Venezuela. The European Union is a body of 27 different member states with nuanced positions towards the Maduro regime and distinct visions for how to resolve the crisis in Venezuela. The purpose of this event is to better understand how the European Union may approach the Venezuelan crisis moving forward and the internal dynamics that will influence this decision. It's clear that Venezuela is too big of a challenge for either the United States or Europe to solve alone or that our neighbors, our friends in the Americas. We're gonna to have to all work together. Uh, this is a very timely discussion for several reasons. The first is that the whole world has been watching the results of the US presidential elections. Uh, it's, it's very clear or highly likely that we're gonna have a, a president elect Biden. And so it's gonna influence the nature and extent of transatlantic collaboration on the Venezuelan crisis. And I think there will be increased uh, and deeper transatlantic outreach on the Venezuelan crisis in a, in a likely Biden administration. Second, on December 6th, Venezuela will hold par parliamentary elections widely expected to be fraudulent. I repeat that, they were widely expected to be fraudulent. The EU ruled out the possibility to send an electoral observation mission, given the lack of time to ensure the minimum conditions of fairness and transparency that will not be met in this, in this election. These, these elections on December the 6th threaten the legitimacy of the National Assembly, currently the only democratic elected institution in the country. The elections will also complicate the legal status of the interim government led by Juan Guaido. The EU's support here is going to be critical and the EU is gonna have a key role. Finally, this event is timely given the urgent human rights situation inside Venezuela. The UN Independent Fact-Finding Mission in Venezuela recently released a report detailing human rights violations and crime against, crimes against humanity perpetrated by the regime. The EU has a role to play in monitoring and responding to these human rights violations. I'm very pleased to introduce the panelists today. I wanna to first recognize my very, very, very dear friend, Anna Palacio, a friend and person who I admire deeply. She had a long and distinguished career in public service. She was the uh, foreign minister of Spain. She was the first woman to hold that position. Uh, she has served as a member of the Spanish parliament where uh, she also uh, led the European delegation to the EU's inter intergovernmental conference and was also a member of the European Parliament. Um, she's had a distinguished career uh, as a lawyer. Uh, she's also uh, led a number of commissions. She was on a commission we did here at CSIS on forced migration. Uh, she was a general counsel and senior vice president at the World Bank. And she has just been a tremendous person. She's also, in, uh, she serves as an elected member of the Spanish Council of State. We also have Isadora Zubilaga, who's a person I'm really looking forward to get to know better. Isadora Zubilaga serves as Deputy Presidential Commissioner for Foreign Affairs, as well as Special Representative to France for the Venezuelan Interim Government. Uh, Isadora has led the Interim Government's diplomatic efforts in Europe, strengthening recognition and support for interim President Guaido's government and bring attention to the, the Maduro regime's human rights violations. Isadora previously served as the Director of International Relations for Leopoldo Lopez during his time as mayor of Chacao. These two panelists will provide unique insights into the internal dynamics of the European Union, as well as its relations with the interim government. With that, I'd like to hand the floor over to Moises Rendon. Moises is the director of the Future of Venezuela initiative here at CSIS. I think Moises does the most impactful and most important work on Venezuela anywhere in the world. It's a privilege to have Moises as a colleague, and I'm really pleased to hand over the floor to my friend and colleague, Moises Rendon. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Stan. It's a, it's a great honor to, to moderate this discussion. Uh, we're going to make today's event as interactive as possible. So I, I, I encourage all of you to post questions in our Zoom Q&A button. I will make sure to read them out loud during our Q&A section. You can also send questions to, to my Twitter at Moises Rendon. Um, but again, uh, we want to hear from you, all of you who are watching live. And, and for the record, this video will be posted afterwards. So those who, can, who, can, who couldn't join us live can watch the event later on. So again, it's a great honor to have you, Isadora and Anna, for this event. We're going to kick off the conversation with you, Isadora. And I think just to get the lay of the land, you know, the EU is a body of 27 states with varying levels of interest and nuanced positions toward the Maduro regime. So I wanted to ask you, how does the EU collaborate with the Venezuelan interim government? And what are you expecting from the European Union to help Venezuela during these days? Well, thank you. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Moises, and thank you, the CSIS, for actually moving forward so intensively in the last months and year regarding Venezuela. I am uh, absolutely convinced that uh, without that work that you guys have been putting, uh, the situation of Venezuela wouldn't be as well known as it is today. And we need to do more. So I appreciate the connection with the European discussion. We have had a couple of uh, discussions in the past. And um, I think that this is essential. And it is essential for uh, several reasons that I would like to express. Uh, but I first want to say that uh, we, we, the president, uh, the interim president Juan Guaido, the National Assembly, myself, and the Venezuelan people are very grateful for what Europe does because um, we are not that close to Europe. No, Venezuela is not that close. We're not even in the strategic um, arc of uh, interest for Europe. And nevertheless, we have had the full support of the European Parliament that represents 500 million people. We have had the support of the European Union, of the European member states individually as well. And we have had the support of, the, of many European men and women who have been champions of uh, our cause. So, the first thing I want to say is thank you very much to Europe uh, for everything that we have uh, been able to achieve so far. But unfortunately, I have to say this right from the start. It's not enough. We need to do more. And, um, and um, I, I, you know, we can develop that in, you know, later in the conversation, but I just want to uh, mention a couple of things that actually while preparing for this talk, I decided to print out all the letters that the interim government has sent to uh, Brussels. And it's actually 16 policy letters. And in all of them, from the very beginning last year addressed to Federica Mogherini to the very last address to Ursula von der Leyen and, and Joseph Borrell, the high, the high representative, um, we're always asking the same thing. We have a roadmap. We want to have presidential elections in Venezuela. And in order to achieve them, we need the support of Europe in the following ways. One, cooperation with the hemisphere. It's very important that Europe cooperates and coordinates actions with our own hemisphere. Secondly, we would like to have more pressure and there has been pressure, but not enough. So we need more sanctions and we need more pressure on different angles that we can speak later on during the conversation. And I think that, you know, this is, um, and it needs to be, there is needs to be also a clear message supporting the interim presidency, uh, the National Assembly, and, um, and uh, the expression of the people of Venezuela far beyond December 6th. And we'll, I'm sure we'll be able to talk about that um, more yeah. uh, during the conversation. Thank you, Saura. Anna, thank you again. It's a great honor really to have you here. Look, uh, every time I talk to European colleagues and member states, you know, one of the things that comes to the table is that Spain is, is the one leading the policy when it comes to Latin America and Venezuela from the, from the European Union. And as you know, Spain shares co strong cultural ties with, the Venezuela, with Venezuela and is home to over 200,000 Venezuela. 
So it also continues to have a political and economic ties to the Maduro regime as well. So how do you see this special and complex relationship between the two countries playing out and more broadly in the European Union as well? Sorry, uh, you have to unmute yourself, Anna. There we go. It's the issue. Um, well, first of all, thank you. And allow me, even if uh, time is the scarcest commodity, to say that I have followed closely what you have been doing here at the CSIS in the project of Venezuela, and you particularly. And I, I remember what you wrote in, in uh, was it uh, August? That is, you know, is the, the actualidad, we would say. Um, I think, I mean, I joined uh, Isadora. I, I, I am uh, one of the many millions of Europeans that are great admirers of the battle for democracy, for freedom, that is being conducted in terrible circumstances. And I would add to what you have been saying, Isadora, and is the, the, the humanitarian situation, the displacement of people, the emigration with COVID and not COVID. But this, I leave it on, on the side. I think that this is an, uh, an area. Just responding to you from afar, and I will get to the Spanish government, but responding to you. Yes, it's true, uh, Spain has a traditional, uh, I would say, um, just special voice when it comes to um, Latin America. Not just Spain, Portugal has two, to a certain degree, Italy, uh, but yeah you know what, uh, European Union is the European Union. First, it's true that there are 27 member states, but it's also true that there is a uh, high representative. So since, uh, since uh, the last reform of the treaties, there is an institutionalization that is there and that we need to bet and we need to, um, to make, uh, I, I think it, they are committed starting by the, they have shown to be committed to the cause. But I think that you have to speak to Paris, very important, Rome, Berlin, of course, Madrid, but also to Brussels and to the institutions. Let's not forget, and Isadora has highlighted the role of the, of the European Parliament. Now, um, I think that when it comes to Spain, it is true that we have a government that is a coalition with one party that has been uh, just how I mean <laughs> promoted, promoted financially and institutionally by the Chavez Maduro regime. So in this government, notwithstanding that the Socialist Party has never been on this wavelength. But it's a coalition government, and this is this is a reality that we cannot avoid. Having said that, I I would highlight that it was under the Sanchez government when the now high representative was Foreign Affairs Minister that Leopoldo Lopez was just hosted at the Spanish Embassy and has been hosted there for for months until he recently left and now he is in Spain. So again, I, it's not all that we, we meaning I'm a Partido Popular, so I'm not, but this, this cannot, we cannot just go as I have heard so many Venezuelans saying, oh, this is a communist government. No, I mean, let's go to the facts. The fact is that the, the interim, President has has been recognized by this government, by the Spanish government. It, there were some issues, okay, but you know what? This is politics, and this is re realism. So I think that um, with difficulties, but uh, it's also the role of the opposition in Spain to 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 pull all the levers and to support the socialist side of this coalition government and not, uh, I mean, and, and try to have Venezuela not 
under the, the influence of the rain. And I think that if you take a look at who the Minister of Foreign Affairs is, it's, it's absolutely middle of the, of the road. I say there are issues, I'm not going to hide, hide that, but let's not, as so many times, just shoot the saying, oh, this is, it's not the case. And again, the now high representative that was foreign affairs minister with the same president in the former government, it's true, in a government where, where Podemos was not, was not a member, but um, he has demonstrated that he's absolutely committed to, to the Venezuela. Yeah. Now, more effectiveness. Okay, I, I fully agree with you. But you know what? It takes two to tango. And if you allow me, in the present case, it takes three to tango. It takes the Venezuela and just the, the interim government and everybody that is on this wavelength. The Europeans, yes, or maybe four to tango. It's a complicated tango. It's uh, the Venezuela, the European Union, uh, the L Latin American uh, just uh, countries, the, the Lima group, the contact group, all this, but it, unless we have the United States in this same wavelength, nothing will be achieved. Yes, thank you, Anna. Those, those are interesting points, and I, I'm going to mention to come back to to many of the issues you put on the table. Um, Isadora, you know, in less than a month, uh, the Maduro regime is hosting hosting parliamentary elections, right, on December sixth. And as you know, this is critical because not only the end of the mandate of the constitutional mandate of the current National Assembly, which as Dan pointed out, is the only democratic institution left in Venezuela, is going to end in January 5th. So we're going to have potentially a, 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 you know, a lot of legal, political and economic implications playing out after January 5th, now that the, the, the National Assembly mandate will end. So I want to ask you, how do you see the European Union's approach towards Venezuela changing after a new and likely, very likely undemocratically elected National Assembly uh, that will potentially be inaugurated on January 5th? And how might the EU le recogni legal recognition of Juan Guaido shift? Can you shed light on that, uh, please? Yes, um, actually, um, the question is not well formulated, and I'm going to tell you why. The elections on December 6th are illegal in, 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 in its origin because it's been convoked by an illegal government. So the very first thing we need to understand, and, 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 and we are the first people in the forefront uh, explaining the international community and the international community has already accepted and established that those elections are fraud. Uh, but it's very important to understand that the, the, the body that, that asked for those elections, the CNE that it's controlled by the illeg illegitimate um, uh, dictatorship and the whole process that has no conditions whatsoever, everything is fraudulent because it's, it's been promoted by an illegal regime, by a dictatorship. So um, that's the very first thing we need to understand. And I think that Venezuelans understood that very well. Um, you know, and several months uh, ago, the president uh, Juan Guaido, together with more than 30 political parties, with more than 100 civil society organizations, and uh, with the majority of Venezuelans, we already said that those elections are not um, legitimate. But let me go further for a second, because when President Guaido was um, uh, named president interim, or, or, or you know, uh, that's how it's called, uh, encargado, uh, and it was recognized by 58 countries, it was recognized to do presidential elections. Because the, the elections that are due in Venezuela are the elections that were illegally um, done in 2018 for uh, presidency. So as long as we don't have presidential elections, free and fair and verified by international community, there will be absolutely no question 
in my understanding, to what to the legitimacy of the National Assembly and to the legitimacy of the interim government. Thank you, Saura. Thanks. Anna, you know, yeah. we're getting a lot of questions on, on the Zoom, and, and I want to tie this question to, to what Carrie Filippetti, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Western Affairs at the State Department, is asking you as well. Um, and, you know, tying this to what Isadora also said in the beginning, that the EU needs to do more, right? The EU needs to do more sanctions, needs to try, uh, freeze assets. And, and for some reason, we haven't seen that action coming out of the EU. We have seen a lot of statements and a lot of, you know, uh, public statements saying that uh, support the support of the interim government and Venezuela is key, but we haven't seen as many actions as, as we probably hope. So I want to ask you. Uh, so Well, yeah, the, I will respond to that, but allow me just to make a go comment ahead. on what, uh, maybe yes. I respond to the question first. Just I think it and, and thank you for I mean for the question from uh, from Mr. Filippetti of I mean doing more. Okay, you know, we can ask to do more, but we have to understand that we are not the United States. And just you speak about freezing assets. Our courts, and this means national courts, and this means the UK have just uh, uh, and now a, a uh, freezing assets and an assets transmission. Uh, our laws are not, and, and we are not the United States. We in, in, uh, in Europe, it would be very, I mean, I think that it, it's, it hasn't happened, but it hasn't happened for a reason that uh, you take the residency and you you trans Georgetown residency and you you transfer it to the to the interim government. So again, uh, I'm a great admirer of the United States, but please don't teach us the lessons. We 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 will never go the route of the sanctions. We have sanctions. We have, and after. There, there was the I mean, the expulsion of the uh, ambassador of the representative of the European Union in Caracas in August. There were targeted sanctions, and there are sanctions, but sanctions that are what we can do in accordance with with our political, uh, just and and uh, and legal structure. So, um, what we would say, and Again, the problem is that for years and for these last years, and I would like to just explain that my understanding of what Elliot Abrams, who was the one that was responsible for this file has done is great. And I think he has done a great job, but frankly, the administration was under the spell of a, of a very, I would say peculiar president. And frankly, when you see what the United States, what the United States has done many things as bilateral, never with the European Union, never multilateral. And this brings me to uh, just make a comment on what Isadora said. Let's be realistic. There is no international community as far as Venezuela is concerned. Because an international community where you don't have China, you don't have Russia, you don't have Iran, and you don't have Turkey, and counting on, you cannot say that it's the international community. The Venezuela, uh, the Venezuela just battle is fought, frankly, by Europeans, really, with our approach, with our, and we are not Americans, we, we are not. I mean, for much that we, and I'm among the most I don't have to make a statement. My life is behind me to, to say that I'm an Atlanticist and I great admire the United States, but we are not. The, the Europeans, um, United States with different approaches, we have had a quite consistent approach, which is not what you can say on the European, uh, on, the, on the United States in the long run, Lately, very bilateral, just United States or President Trump or the White House speaking with China, speaking with Russia in order to, but not 
with the Europeans. It's true that when the European Union sent this mission uh, in September, we didn't tell the White House. That's true. And if you, if you, if I can summarize, this is what cannot happen. We have to be in it together with the L Latin Americans. Not all of them are that enthusiast, but the ones that are concerned first among, among other issues because of the immigration, immigration and that are committed to, the, to freedom and to democracy in, in Venezuela. And then we need to find other allies. Frankly, this is what we should do together. Uh, and together with, to find Africans that care, uh, to have a, an Atlantic basin to commit more Canada, to, these are, this is the thing, but Isadora, I'm sorry, there is no international community, no international community. And each time I discuss with, with you, my friends, I have to tell them what is the international community without China, as I say, without Russia, there is no international community. Let's be realistic. Um, European Union is the only party that can speak to everybody. And you know what? In a situation like this one, this is a fantastic asset. I hope that in a new administration, uh, you, the, 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 the United States will also join this approach that you can stand, you have to stand. We stand firm, from, firm on principles. And as you saw, uh, and Isadora said, the result of this exploratory trip was that there were no conditions to even send a, a first, uh, a delegation to explore the conditions of the, the, there was no conditions there. So the European Union is, is a stands on principles. Now, last word, after uh, January 5, after January 5, we are in a difficult bind. And this, it will have to be a very clear political concerted effort, because frankly, in terms of formal, formal legal terms, we are in a, you know, in a difficult situation. I'm sorry, these are the, the church, beautiful, beautiful church across the, the street because today it's a La it's La Almudena. It's a big, uh, it's, a, it's a big holiday in Madrid. So I rest there and I mute my phone. Anna, thank you. I think that, that background noise is, is actually making a, a conversation more more level, <laughs> more more living. It's ahora connecting to what um, Anna said. Look, the, the European Union is not the U.S., and and I think that's a very valid point, right? In in terms of of how how the European can, what else can they do? But I wanna wanna ask you. Uh, so, if, if European foreign ministers comes to you, and and, and they, they you know they have the willingness to help, and they ask you, it's ahora. Um, in addition to recognizing Juan Guaido, which I, I think that's where the line is going, especially given the, the nature of the fraudulent of the election on December 6th, that recognition, I, I assume, will continue. Uh, but in addition to that ask, what else can you ask the European Union to do for Venezuela? I mean, uh, we, we already talked about sanctions. It's a complex environment in the European Union to increase sanctions on Venezuela for various reasons. That, Anna pointed out there are assets in the continent that are also very important to freeze. But what else is the interim government and yourself asking the European counterparts to continue helping Venezuela and restore their democracy? Well, that's a good question because it allows me to continue with what Anna said before. And I, and I, and I need to emphasize something that it was not clear on her statement. Um, we do believe that the international community has played a, an incredibly important role. We do believe that the coalition of 58 countries, including the US, including Canada, the Lima group, the hemisphere, especially Colombia, Ecuador, Brazil, Peru, there are countries that are suffering our crisis firsthand. It's fundamental for, um, for arriving to a, to a safe port and, and, and to arrive to a solution, a political urgent solution that Venezuelans need. Of course, she's absolutely right. You're absolutely right, Anna, that uh, the tango is not completed if we don't have uh, the other countries that are key 
in the international community to understand and facilitate the transition in Venezuela, such as China and Russia and others. And it's not an easy task, as we know. Uh, but it's very important to understand that what we are proposing, what we as an interim government, we as Venezuelan citizens, and we as the, as the international community that accompany us, and, the, and, and, and in that I emphasize again the importance of the region, we have built a roadmap, a roadmap based on an emergency government, a transitional government that can organize presidential elections. So, so this is very important that we get the Europeans on board. And this is part of the quest that I, or, and the task that I have, and not only myself, but many other ambassadors, representatives of President Juan Guaido in Europe that are doing a phenomenal job, as you said at the beginning, from Paris to Berlin, to London, to Lisbon, to Madrid, uh, uh, and, and all of the 27 countries and beyond. Because let me tell you one thing, it is, it is the role of Spain is key uh, because it's a culturally and historical uh, role that Spain has played within the European Union when it regards to Latin America. But the role of other countries that have accompanied uh, this fight for freedom for, for, for us, for Venezuelans, has been fundamental. The, the, the role of the Netherlands, of Germany, of the Czech Republic, of the Baltics, of, you know, I don't want, I, I would have to name them all because actually I shouldn't leave anyone out. They all have been very, very key for, uh, what are the things that we're asking? And with this, I finally answered your question. Sanctions, individual sanctions. We're not asking for anything different than that because we understand the dynamics of Europe. Uh, and, and, and Europe has been very explicitly that uh, they, they, they do believe in individual sanctions. In fact, we have had four rounds of sanctions um, in, in, since 2017, and there are 36 individuals, Venezuelan individuals that are sanctioned today. That is very important, but we need to uh, increase that number, and especially after the fact-finding mission report where more than 46 people are signaled, uh, of, response, of being responsible for crimes against humanity, those people need to be sanctioned. It is absolutely uh, unacceptable that they could travel to European soil, the European soil that gave birth to human rights, and that uh, people like this uh, that are responsible of the atrocities that are described in that, in, in that report could travel to Europe. And only 13 out of those 46 individuals are currently sanctioned by the EU. But I also want to mention that there is a whole, um, a whole dimension of, of uh, international justice that needs to, be, um, needs to go forward. Um, the European Parliament has already stated that uh, the case of Venezuela needs to move forward at the International Criminal Court, and we need to support that. When two years ago, uh, different countries, including Canada and Chile and Colombia, um, made a referral in The Hague, uh, there were several countries in Europe, like France, Germany, and the Czech Republic that supported that uh, step forward. And we need now to go further. And uh, there is indication that already the, the ICC uh, uh, has admitted with the declarations just recently last week that uh, there is in fact uh, crimes against the humanity that have been committed in, in my country. And there is also universal justice that can be activated in individual countries. And there is also the Magnitsky um, law that it's going to be implemented in Europe uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a legal framework uh, as of January, 2021. Um, there are other issues that we're trying to put forward in the European um, discussion, such as environmental sanctions, uh, because it is unacceptable today that we can allow the illegal trafficking of gold in Venezuela to, um, to, to, to have a place in, in European soil as well. So um, there are other things like the death squads uh, named FIES that should be uh, named as terrorist groups um, by, by the international community. And, and just to end, because I know that we're going to continue with all the conversation, but I just wanna emphasize one last and most underlying thing. And that is we need from Europe coordination with the Americas. And when I speak about the Americas, I mean from Canada all the way down to 
uh, Chile and Argentina. And, and we need, because this is a fight for dignity and this is a fight for human rights. And this is a fight for the human lives in Venezuela and, and in the neighboring countries that are been uh, suffering and even lost. So we need everybody in the, in the coalition that supports a democratic transition in Venezuela to be on board. Look, thank you. We, we have tons of que great questions on the Zoom. Um, Anna, do you want to comment something else? Just, just one sentence. Well, Isadora started her response saying, I'm going to clarify a few things that Anna Palacio didn't clarify. I think she has exactly said what I had in the, in the main lines, except that the international community, as I say, if you subtract China and the others, there is no international community. We are speaking of something, what, whatever, the, the, the ones that belong in freedom. And by the way, this is something that is, is uh, I mean, will be one of the big issues and that if I were Venezuela, I would uh, push it forward more. The democracies, and this is why I, I was saying I would extend to Africa, to other places that where freedom resonates, because it's not the international community. The international community, you can speak about the international community on climate change. There you have, even with uh, United States or President Trump saying that they withdraw, they, there you have, because you have states and governors and all that, but there is no international community. And I think that this is, and personally, Isadora is the wrong approach, saying that it is the internet. No, it's the community of freedom lovers of democracy of democracy uh, countries in the world. Now, um, on the sanctions, I mean, yes, we can. We have to go forward. As I say, after after August ex expulsion of the representative, but again, you have to be there and insist because our our procedures are extremely complex, extremely complex, and we have to cope with that because uh, when you say the European Union, well, uh, it's not exactly that it's 27 foreign policies. It's not that. We have a policy of the European Union and the evidence is what we have seen in Venezuela, but it's complicated. It's, it's a complex issue. So individual, individual um, sanctions, absolutely yes. Pushing, I, I read Ben Souda, the, the, the procureur, the um, public uh, prosecutor at the, at the uh, ICC has a declaration that is, that has to be, I mean, has to be made known by everybody. Uh, so we are on the same wavelength. It's not that I'm not clear. I'm extremely yeah. clear. And, uh, and Anna, I think that the, the union is there. Look, I think you, you, I mean, you, you're making good points, and I, 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 at some extent, agree because if, if you take in key countries like Russia, China out of the equation, then the, the international community is is very limited. But I, I wanted to follow up and ask you, what role do you envision for the EU? Can the EU play any role engaging with these countries? And I want to hear specifically about Turkey, a country that you know wants to be part of the European Union. And is playing a, a key role in Venezuela when it comes to to illegal my mining. Honest, yeah, go ahead. My honest assessment: We need the United States, the only country in the world that has the convening power that is needed to put Venezuela on with the support. So the Europeans, we will be there supporting. But the convening power today is the indispensable nation. United States, I'm sorry, and this, this is one of the, the, the damage, collateral damages of the American first bilateral policy of the last administration, is that America first is not America of the 20th century, but in the 21st century, we need an America that leads, that leads in a different way, that leads by, by just, as, as I say, convening around a a cause like the freedom for Venezuela, convening the like-minded in the world that go to Japan, that go and that with, with this strength, but this can only be done by the United States. Just sit down with China, sit down with Russia 
and negotiate and sit down with Cuba as well. With you know, it's not yeah. just. It's I, I, I. So okay, I, I think I, I. Okay, and I, I agree, but I, my concern, Anna, and and Isadora, I want to bring into the conversation too, is that for some reason Venezuela has not been on top of the agenda when it comes to when, when the U.S. meet with China or the U.S. meet with Russia. You know, there are many other global issues that they have to tackle. And, and if that's the case for the U.S. at some extent, then my concern is even bigger when it comes to the European Union's agenda. And I don't know where Venezuela is on, on that list for bilateral meetings. When, when the EU meets with China, with Turkey, do they talk about Venezuela? And, and if not, um, how, how do you think they should be engaging but, those countries? Yes, go ahead. But, again, I mean, I hear you. but, but sorry, sorry, one sentence. The European Union doesn't have the clout. The only, the only uh, nation that can do that is the United States. I'm a proud European, but I know, we know our, our limitations because we are not the United States of Europe. If we were, we could say, but we are not. We have areas, and in these areas, we have a okay. very powerful, but it's it's for the United States, and we will be there supporting. Got I it. Isaura, I, I want to hear your thoughts too, but let, let me also ask you, um, I mean, we, we now have a president-elect in the U.S., and, and, and I, I want to get your thoughts, and I want to also hear Anna's afterwards. How might the results of the U.S. presidential elections influence the U.S. the, the European's coordinated response to the Maduro regime? Going back to to Anna's point that without the U.S., there's really not much that the EU can do. But now we have a new administration, possibly a more open, uh, a more uh, a administration to work with EU with the EU and Venezuela. So how do you see that playing out in the in the coming months? Well, um, um, I want to address both things, so I'll start with the last. I think that you you are a witness, Moises, that uh, we have worked the policy with the United States in a bipartisan manner. And I have to say something that it's very important and it relates to Europe as well. Everything that we have done in Europe, as we have done in the US, must and always has to be bipartisan because our cause is not the cause of one ideology against another. It's uh, actually the Venezuelan cause has unified uh, people that uh, normally are not unified on other issues. And, and, and we saw that in the State of the Union address when President Guaido was there and we saw the, you know, the surprise and genuine uh, phase of, uh, pres of, um, of uh, the, the President of Congress, Nancy Pelosi, and how the policy towards Venezuela has always been bipartisan and everything that we have done. This is very important to where we are today. Uh, where we have um, a, 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 a team that may come in uh, that will work with the institutions that work in the United States. And uh, I am sure, I am convinced that um, all these teams have the same, um, the same diagnosis, first of all. So there is no question that neither in the US nor in Europe uh, all the decision makers and the leadership knows very well that Maduro is a dictator and that Maduro has to leave power in order to give birth to democracy and rebuilding and reconciliation in Venezuela. I have absolutely no doubt that that, with, that is the position of the president-elect as, well as, uh, as, as well as the current administration. So um, I, I, yeah. having, having said that, I do want to address one second about the international coalition, because I absolutely agree with Anna, you know, when I mentioned the international coalition, we're talking about, you know, the countries that represent the free world, um, but quite influential, right? So uh, I think it's very important that we go hand in hand with the United States, but that we also understand that we have to be um, having a very regional approach. To me, the regional approach is fundamental. And in order to speak with countries like China, or to countries like Russia, or to Turkey, or to Cuba. We need to address this in a regional way. What, what is the most convenient thing for the region? A Venezuela that is a failed state, that it's in the hand of irregular groups, that the, uh, there is a dictatorship that it's cruel, that it oppresses its people and commits crimes against humanity, that provokes an exodus of more than 5 million people, or 
what's better for the region, a Venezuela that is back on track, on democracy, on you know, on rec recuperation, rebuilding, investment, and that will be um, uh, um, a source of um, of, a, of a much better future for both Venezuelans and our neighbors in the country. So I, I strongly believe in the regional approach. Thanks, Isadora. And I, I want to get your thoughts on the same question. Like, what do you? How might the results of the U.S. presidential elections influence? the US EU EU coordinator coordinator response to the Maduro regime uh, you're muted there you go uh, to be honest i yeah. think that in europe there was i would say in general terms an expectation for a change of an, of uh, just administration precisely because we we in the European Union, we have this multilateral reflex, but we also know where we stand. We need the bilateral relation. We need a, a healthy relation with the United States and frankly, a predictable relationship. What, was, what for us was very uh, difficult with the past administration is the unpredictability. Even beyond, frankly, the bad manners, the unpredictability. And last but not least, the third thing that we missed is this leadership of the United States. And I'm not saying that the, the good old days, there are a few in Europe that think that with, with the new administration, we will go back to the, to, to the good old days that by the way, are not realistic. This is the rosy picture that we have in mind of what were the old days. The old days were good, but were had their issues. And this is what we want, a working uh, partnership with, with the United States that understand that America first is not America bilateral, is America just going back to the, to the multilateral institutions and, and working with, the, with uh, the European Union. And we are very hopeful. Now, let's be realistic, this administration just the results of the the results of the elections are very close this administration we have a lot of fish to fry i think that it is our responsibility starting by you isadora and by the by the venezuelans in in united states and in in general terms and for us that are committed to the venezuelan case to bring this issue top of the agenda, which is not going to be easy. But I think there is, at least in Europe, we are very hopeful uh, that the, the, the manners, the predictability, and then that there will be a multilateral leadership of the United States, a stronger uh, transatlantic. You know, people in Europe forget, for instance, just to give one example, that the 2% that is so controversial of NATO expenditure, it was built, it, it was Gates in his far away speech. So it was the Secretary of the Defense of the, of the Obama administration in 2011 that just highlighted this. So we, we, we have to be realistic. Uh, there is an opportunity, but there is an opportunity that is not a rosy, opportunity and that we will have to work for it. And we count on you, CSIS, to keep the, the, <laughs> the issue in all the, the offices that matters. Thank you. I'm humbled, Anna, for that task. And, and we'll, we'll make sure to, to, to shed a light, keep shedding a light on this issue. It's so important for everybody. Look, it's, it's, all, it's you know, we have about seven minutes left. And, and I'm trying to go to my notes here as you, as you were talking. We cover sanctions, we cover human rights violations and the EU doing more on that front, especially the, the, the role that the EU has on, on the international you know, human rights front is important. Illegal mining was mentioned. We didn't cover it that deep, but it's, it's another important issue. We also talk about foreign influence by China and other countries. We call them the fabulous five by this report that we published a month ago, and those include China, Russia, Iran, Cuba, and Turkey. And, and you know, just to give you the two cents highlight, is it, we, you know, each of these countries has so different and strategic interests in Venezuela, and therefore 
the response needs to be also different to each of those, right? So that, that's an important thing to keep in mind. But I wanna talk about negotiation. And this is, you know, the, the word negotiation itself sometimes is toxic in, in when it comes to Venezuela. And, and for good reasons, we, we have tried more than 10 different attempts to negotiate with Maduro in the last, in the last uh, years and, and none of them has worked. Quite the opposite. They have bought more time to Maduro to stay in power. They have divided the opposition. They have frustrated the Venezuelan people. And, and now we are in this dark room when it comes to negotiation again. Uh, but going to Elliot Abrams, and uh, you know, we hosted Elliot a few months ago in CSIS and he said, there are three options, more or less. I'm, I'm, I'm just rephrasing what he said. There are three options in Venezuela, magic, military intervention, which no one likes, no one wants, and then a negotiated solution. So my question to both of you, and hopefully with this wrap up and, and make sure to do any concluding remarks, what would be a role for the European Union for a serious negotiation attempt with the Maduro regime in the, in, in, in the near future? And do you see that as a, as a, as a potential a scenario and what, how the European Union together with the US of course, can shape what a serious negotiation, successful negotiation attempt with Maduro will look like? Over to you. What, uh, look, uh, the, the approach of a negotiated solution has been the approach of the European Union all along. So this we have to acknowledge. This has been the approach of the European Union. There are other parties that have had doubts. I'm not speaking about magic, but you know, maybe as well magic. So uh, for, for the European Union, take the last uh, travel of this, uh, of this uh, uh, officials of the, of the European Commission that went there. It's an attempt of negotiation. It's an attempt of negotiation. There is a special envoy that is an experience, is Enrique Iglesias, a very experienced, high level, extremely wise. We, we are there. The, the issue is that in order to embark in productive negotiations, you need to have a government that wants these negotiations. The conclusion of the Europeans, notwithstanding the attempts by Norway, by the the group of contact that has been uh, just, I would say, I mean, uh, supported by the European Union at least, is that there is no real willingness for the moment. And this is where the United States, we will go back to the United States, unless there is a commitment of the United States to put all its convening might, convening might, to have, to be able to, uh, engage in a multilateral and, the, and uh, just have with Canada, with the, the, the Europeans, with other with uh, other regional actors from Colombia to other uh, other regional actors to um, just bring bring uh, as the you, you know the, this is a this is it will not be done on one go, it will have to put pressure on the government for the government to really negotiate because the, the, the issue is that the government is not negotiating. On the part of the, 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 I mean, the opposition, first, be united. It hasn't always been the case and I know what I'm speaking about because I, this, has, this is a long, I, and I leave these uh, divisions that are very damaging. This is the, the first thing. The, the, second, the second and e extremely important, be realistic. I mean, yeah, okay, magic, it's Maduro disappears. And then we have a, okay, well, how do you do the trick? Nothing here, nothing there. And, and you make the, the rabbit disappear. Well, it's, it doesn't work like that. So uh, realistic and united. And, uh, and this is a work in progress. I know, I know it's not easy. And then uh, I want to finish by the suffering of the people of Venezuela. 
And again, there the European Union were behind, and Spain in particular, the conference. Because yes. this is a regional issue, absolutely, Isadora. It's a regional issue because it, it could destabilize Peru and Colombia, well, Brazil less, but okay, it can mean a big issue in Brazil. And in, in general terms, I think that, that the, 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 the immigration, uh, we need to, five millions of which almost two millions in Colombia. I mean, in Colombia, um, the European Union put forward this uh, conference. And I think that this is an effort that has to be pursued. And then, frankly, uh, the situation that my friends tell me about the situation in Venezuela, in Venezuela is so terrible that we need to imagine how to, how to make, I mean, how to ease this suffering. Because what, what you have said is absolutely uh, true, Moises. Time hasn't played against Maduro. Misery is there, people are hungry, there are no medicines, nothing works, and yet, uh, I mean, I hope for the best on this consultation on the 12th, but for the moment, I don't see a big movement because people are exhausted when you, yeah. when you cannot hold together. So again, realism and unity. Thank you, Anna. Isadora, any, any final remarks? Yes, well, I know that we're running out of time, but I, I want to add one thing. We have a unifying agenda, both inside and outside of Venezuela. It's very important that the approach, it's unified. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that it has to be urgent. I mean, our negotiated solution, what we, what we are aiming, uh, the, what, what the Europeans call the political solution, needs to include the word urgent because people are dying, as Anna just mentioned. We already worked last year with the, with the help of the, of the Norwegians in the Oslo talks for a roadmap. The emergency government is a roadmap that has been discussed with the entire um, coalition of countries that, of the free world that support us. And it has also been addressed with the other part of the international community that needs to be a part of the solution like Russia and China. So um, I just want to end by saying something because this is a message for Europe and for the world. I don't want to leave this forum without mentioning the 10 political prisoners that today are in a prison and have European nationality. There are 10 individuals, military men, civilians, and actually one woman from Spain, Ana Maria Auxiliadora Delgado, is a Spanish woman who is in a prison today and nobody's talking about her. Europeans need to address this issue now. So, you know, thank you so much, Moises. We would be able to talk for much more time, yes. much more longer with a wonderful <laughs> Ana Palacio and with your, with your uh, moderation. So, you know, let's do it again. Thank you. It was a fascinating conversation. Really great, uh, Anna and Isaura. Grateful that that you put time on this, and and we're gonna make sure to keep shedding light on this. This conversation is not gonna end here. We're gonna continue doing more analysis and more events and roundtables to discuss what the European Union can do more because there's a lot more to do. So what what is that future? What vision look like? for Venezuela and hopefully we, we can re, uh, join, uh, you have him join us again in the future, okay? But thank you, Anna. And thank you everybody who is watching. I, I know you have a lot of questions. They're all great questions. Um, and we're gonna continue this conversation again in the near future, okay? But thank you everybody for, for making time. <laughs>